Hey folks, Matt Eason here, Scholar Gladiatoria. So I guess quite a lot of people who watch my videos are interested in medieval warfare. Well, so am I. It admittedly is not the main focus of most of my videos I do these days, um, but it was actually definitely, without a shadow of a doubt, my main focus of interest when I was younger. And um, as most of you know, I studied medieval history and archaeology at university. And um, that was, you know, the medieval period, particularly the 14th and 15th centuries, so the Hundred Years' War and the Wars of the Roses, were really my focus. Um, and so I have a lot of books on the subject, and I'm actually revisiting a few of them at the moment. Uh, one of them being, which I enjoyed a lot, it has some inaccuracies in it, okay? This isn't a book review, don't worry. Um, but it's called The Road to Cressy, The English Invasion of France, 1346, by Livingston and Witzel, or Witzel, it might be. Um, and um, it's, a, it's an interesting book for a number of reasons, and I would recommend, if you're interested in the Hundred Years' War, reading The Road to Cressy by Livingston and Witzel, or Witzel. Um, primarily because it doesn't just focus on the Battle of Cressy. So, you know, if you look most places on um, online, or if you look at things like those Osprey books, that kind of stuff, they focus Generally speaking, they, they'll tell you a bit about the political context and the the, the nobility involved in, uh, um, in the conflict and why it happened, but then they'll tell you about the battle. But what they don't teach you or don't tell you an awful lot about is the campaign, and that's why I really like this book, because it's called The Road to Cressy, um, because it actually focuses more on the road to Cressy rather than just Cressy rather than just the Battle of Cressy uh, in 1346 and so it talks about the preparations in 1345 um, and it talks about the the skirmishes actually that that happened up to the battle and this is the thing that I think is really important for people to realize that medieval warfare didn't consist purely of battles. It consisted of sieges and skirmishes and all sorts of other actions, large set piece battles like the Battle of Cressy or um, the Battle of Castillon or um, the Battle of um, uh, whatever, you know, Agincourt, whatever you want to pick really. Um, these were relatively rare occurrences um, and, you know, that's why we remember them. That's why there are books focused specifically on these, um, on these particular battles. Um, but most warfare obviously took the part of kind of attrition, so wearing down your opponent, which was often very long, some sieges lasted very long periods of time, sometimes, sometimes months, very occasionally years, um, and, and of course small skirmishing, raiding actions, so the, the term chevauché, uh, which comes from the French uh, word for riding, uh, probably I've butchered my pronunciation there, so apologies for that to my French viewers, but the chevauché, which was the way that the, the English in particular um, fought the Hundred Years' War was lots and lots of raiding, and that's what the Hundred Years' War was mostly made up of. It was raiding. Um, so riding through the uh, the opponent's lands, and remember that the Hundred Years' War, it wasn't, in a way it was between England, England and France, and in a way it wasn't. You could argue it was actually between different duchies of France because France wasn't unified in the way that England was. Um, the Duke of Burgundy, for example, at various points, the, uh, Burgundy was on the English side and the French side, if we call it English and French. And Brittany, for example, often was um, uh, allied or at least had interests with the, the English crown. And so did um, Flanders as well because the Flemish well, wool trade um, or cloth trade rather relied on English wool and this kind of thing. So the, the, in, the, um, the way that these different states, if we call them that, okay, so nation states kind of interacted with each, with each other, wasn't purely, it wasn't like England versus France like in the Napoleonic Wars kind of sense. It was much more complex than that. And of course, Aquitaine, um, Gascony, was held by the English for a very long period of time, I think about 300 years. So um, actually a large chunk of what's now France was kind of English for a long period of time. And in fact, when um, Aquitaine fell in 1453, 1454, um, a lot of, it, the evidence seems to be that a lot of people from Aquitaine actually, you know, left. <laughs> a lot of them went back to England because their business interests and political interests were with the English crown, not with the French crown. Anyway, getting back to the point of this, what I really wanted to talk about um, very relatively briefly, 
was the cost of soldiers. Now this is definitely, this is within an English royal context. So this is the cost of English soldiers in the English army at this time. And I often get paid, I um, often get paid, <laughs> if only, I often get asked how much medieval soldiers got paid. Um, and um, you know, that's, <laughs> that's like asking how long is a piece of string, as we would say in English. It's a, it's a where do you start and where do you end? But we kind of can, and within this, it's very nice in this book, they've actually broken it down, and I understand that this is taken from Prestwich's book, earlier book. Um, and it, it's interesting, it gives you a sense of what normal soldiers were paid. Now, what do I be, mean by normal soldiers? Well, remember that um, in the 14th and 15th century, most soldiers, in certainly in an English army or a French army, were not knights, okay, or were not men at arms. Most of them were things like archers or um, what we'll loosely describe here as spearmen. That's, that's a kind of problematic term because it can mean different things in different periods. But essentially if you want to think about it as the medieval predecessor of something like a pikeman or a halberdier. Okay, so someone who's not wearing full armour but someone who has some armour, bits of armour, and someone who has usually a pole weapon. So most medieval armies are made predominantly, you can, yeah, you can say there's artillery, there's sappers or engineers, there are knights and men at arms, and there are all sorts of other things, but the primary fighting elements of a medieval European army, certainly in Western Europe, are archers on foot and pole arm users on foot, and we'll call them spearmen, okay, because the spear was the predominant type of pole arm. Yes, it could sometimes be a bill or a halberd or a glaive or whatever, a gisarm, but fundamentally it's someone with a pole weapon. And of course, these two things, if you think about it in a 17th century context, we primarily have musketeers or people operating muskets and pikemen. And those two things work together. Well, it was the same in the medieval army, of course. You, you can't just have an army made of archers because they'd be extremely vulnerable to just being taken out in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Okay, yes, they can fight for themselves to some extent, but they're not gonna have pole weapons because they're operating a bow, so they're gonna have swords and bucklers and things like this. Um, so you need um, ha troops that are focused on hand-to-hand -hand fighting and you need troops that are hand um, focused on missile um, weapons. So in France it was predominantly crossbows, in England it was predominantly what we'd call longbows or just bows, um, and then they needed types of troops who were focused on hand-to-hand -hand combat. And then yes you had mounted troops as well, and mounted troops break down into different types also. Um, in if we approach it from a sort of Napoleonic or 19th century point of view, you've essentially got light cavalry and heavy cavalry. And if you look at um, all across Europe, whether you're looking at Spain or France or Germany or Poland, you'll essentially find that cavalry does, generally speaking, break down into either being light cavalry or heavy cavalry. An example of that, if we go to the Mongols, for example, the Mongols clearly had light cavalry, most famously horse archers, but they also had heavy cavalry who were wearing head-to-foot armour and using lances, so completely different type of cavalry. And really that goes all the way through to the 19th century when cavalry was still being used. A cuirassier is a heavy cavalry, or you could say to some extent a lancer is perhaps heavy cavalry, although they were classed as light cavalry. Um, and then you've got light cavalry in the 19th century who would be predominantly using their firearms and being mobile shooters, shall we say, and occasionally getting into um, scraps with their sabres. Right, so coming back to the medieval period, so from Prestwich, he um, breaks down the pay thus, okay, so a foot spearman at the bottom end of the spectrum, so you would uh, imagine a levied troop with a pole weapon, usually a spear, um, two pence per day, okay, um, a foot archer, three pence per day. Now that's interesting, why would a foot archer be paid more than a a foot pole arm user? Well, quite simply because to be a qualified archer, qualified like there's a certificate, uh, but to be, a, to be an archer who would pass muster, in other words, who would pass the test, who'd show that they could operate their longbow, you have to be somewhat more physically capable, and um, at least practiced, than someone using a pole weapon. Anybody can use a spear effectively enough to fight in a medieval army, so long as they've they've got some basic degree of physical health, you know, they're not ill and this kind of stuff, okay? Whereas someone using a longbow, for example, or, or even operating a crossbow with a reasonable rate of fire, uh, I, I realize there's no fire involved, but let's use that term anyway, because it's useful. Um, operating a crossbow or operating a longbow requires skill and training, which frankly, 
to just hold a spear in the line and not run away doesn't require so much training. So there we go. So foot archers were paid three pence per day. A mounted archer, now we'll come back to that term in a minute, a mounted archer, six pence per day. So twice as much as a foot archer. Now, in an English context, a mounted archer is not like a horse archer, okay? So it's not someone shooting from horseback. Uh, Mike Lodes may slightly disagree with that because he has a theory that the English sometimes shot from horseback. There is almost nothing to back that up. Yes, there's a couple of images in artwork where they're doing that, uh, but I won't go into that now, that's for another video. Generally speaking, these are foot archers who have horses. Okay, so why are they paying, being paid six pence a day? Well, quite simply, they can travel faster, and generally speaking, they're probably better equipped because if an archer can afford a horse, and bear in mind a horse is an expensive thing, and we'll come to that in a minute, the horse is an expensive thing. So if a, an archer can afford a horse, they can afford to look after a horse, which has to come out of their pay, so they don't get to keep all of that sixpence. Okay, some of that will go on food and possibly stabling for the horse. Um, but if they can afford to have a horse, then they're probably overall better equipped. So, you know, if I'm, if I'm a foot archer and I've made, I've had a good season of campaigning and I think I'm going to invest some money in my equipment and level up so I can become a mounted archer, I'm going to buy a horse because I need to have a horse to get that extra pay. And that's very important. You have to provide your own equipment um, almost all the time in a medieval context, arrows being the one exception to that. Um, but to get the higher rate of pay, I have to have the horse to qualify as a mounted archer. But if I do that, and if I've got enough money to do that, I've probably also got enough money to buy maybe a padded jack, maybe a early form of brigandine, maybe a male shirt, maybe a, a helmet sale or kettle hat. Um, maybe, you know, maybe some leg armour, something like this. So it's likely, very likely, I would say, that people who could afford to be mounted archers could also afford better equipment. And that means that they're more effective soldiers as well. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're better trained, although it might do. Um, but it means that they're essentially more likely to last longer in combat, not only because they're less vulnerable to enemy arrows, but they're more useful in hand-to-hand -hand combat, so they have a more important, vulnerable, um, more multi-purpose role. But also remember, of course, armour makes a huge difference, and if you've got a medium level of armour versus no armour, and some foot archers would have had no armour, that makes you hugely more effective in combat, because someone who's got a padded gambeson with a male shirt and an iron helmet is suddenly much harder to kill than someone who's just wearing their clothes and a padded hat, okay? So armor, very important. Um, next up is a hobbler, which is a type of um, light cavalry, I believe, um, is six pence a day. So hobbler and mounted archer is roughly the same kind of thing. Then we've got a mounted sergeant at one shilling per day, okay? So the amount of money suddenly steps up. Um, and a knight bachelor at two shillings a day. Now really, mounted sergeant and knight bachelor are really what we would call men at arms. So they're armored men, probably at this period in 1346, predominantly, well, definitely with male, head to foot, and with a fair amount of plate as well. So um, you may possibly, in 1346, you may possibly have got the occasional poorer end of, of mounted sergeant who maybe was only had mail and a maybe a bassinet helmet, but you probably would have got, um, most of them would have had at least a coat of plates or some plate on their arms and legs, particularly on their legs actually for mounted um, soldiers. But they could fight mounted or on foot, and that's important to note as well. So although they've got horses, they don't always fight on foot, especially, and this is absolutely the case, in English armies, okay? English armies famously at this period fought on foot, traditionally, um, especially against the French. Um, so the French, still in 1346, they were putting a very big um, emphasis on their cavalry force and cavalry charges, whereas the English had switched, partly inspired by fighting against the Scots um, in the late uh, 1200s, um, and, well, and early beginning of the 1300s as well, um, and partly with the Welsh campaign. So a combination of experience of Welsh archery and Scottish shiltrons, okay, in the end of the 1200s and beginning of the 1300s, Edward III had combined the knowledge from those things and essentially created almost like an early version of pike and musket warfare, where he would pick a defensive position, um, he would put 
probably put stakes in front of the archers, um, but he'd had a, a, essentially a dedicated missile troop force, the archers, and have people with pole arms fighting defensively and making the French come to them, or whoever they were fighting, sometimes the Spanish or Italians or whoever. Um, and then at the top we've got Banneret at four shillings a day. Now what you've got to say as well is that the reason, one of the reasons why they've got that heightened rate of pay, partly it's because they're a higher social class and if you want that higher social class, those knights, those men at arms, if you want them to come and fight in your army you have to offer more money to get them to come, to incentivize them to come. But also that money, as with the mounted archer, some of it has to go towards maintaining their own equipment, servants, horses and everything else. So they need to have the more money to, to basically pay for their retainers um, and their force around them. And these knights and bannerets and the, the nobles, the high lords, were incredibly important at raising troops. Okay? The king relied on them in a feudal-ish structure, relied on them for raising the troops. So if we go to the basic level of soldiers, so the common foot soldiers, be they with pole arms at two pence a day, or uh, foot archers at three pence a day, or indeed mounted archers at um, six pence a day, um, how does that compare to other things in the period? Well, interestingly, mariners or seamen uh, were paid, um, uh, were also paid three pence a day while in the king's service. Um, but that is not particularly good pay at all within the grander um, scale of things. So as it points out here, it points us out that uh, in 1346, for example, the king, King Edward III, was employing harness makers, so people making harness, I presume they mean for horses in this case, although the word harness can mean armour sometimes, um, harness makers at four pence per day. So craftsmen, relatively skilled craftsmen, at the, in fact twice the rate of pay of a foot soldier with a spear, okay, and a better rate of pay than a qualified longbowman as well. Um, and other, other uh, skilled craftsmen earned similar or higher wages, certainly someone like a, you know, someone working stone, um, a stonemason, this kind of thing, or, or a very, a more specific skill like a, um, perhaps a, a blade maker or this kind of thing, a tailor, would be earning more. So in actual fact, two pence or three pence or even six pence a day of the mounted archer is not a good rate to pay. But as the authors point out, you think, well, why would someone serve as a common foot soldier or a common archer then? And the answer is booty, because we love the booty, the loot. Um, and the fact is that common soldiers got a share of the loot. So ultimately, all of the loot that was gathered on campaign would go to the king, and then it would get split up between his um, commanders, and then the commanders would split their share, and then it would get split all the way down the line. So fundamentally, your daily rate of pay as a soldier, whether you were levied, in other words, whether you were raised from in a local area because the government told you you had to serve now, or whether you were indentured, that is whether you signed a contract to serve for a certain amount of time. So in other words, whether you were not kind of forcefully levied or whether you were volunteer, you got paid the same rate as far as I can tell. Um, and uh, your primary goal actually would not be your daily rate of pay because that wasn't particularly good. It was really just enough for you to sustain yourself. What you were hoping for was loot. So that's very important when you look at medieval warfare for understanding the context of why these soldiers fought. They were essentially looters. They were raiders that were being <laughs> operated within, within a, a, a kind of a, a proper structure um, under the king's service and under these commanders. So very, very, very different context to a modern soldier, completely different really, okay? They were in it for the loot. Just to finish off, I just thought I'd give you an example of some other objects, military objects, um, that cost money, to put these amounts of money within the context of the time, because obviously two pence, three pence, six pence don't have a lot of meaning to you or I, unless you compare it to what other things you can buy for that amount of money. And it's interesting that during the build-up for um, this campaign, um, they bought a number of crossbows, and these are recorded in the in, well, in the records. Um, and they bought forty crossbows um, for the crew of a ship called uh, La Magdalene, as in Mary Magdalene. Um, and they bought forty crossbows, which was almost enough, or pretty much enough, to equip the entire crew with crossbows, which is quite interesting when you think what did naval warfare look like at that time? Well, a lot of it was just two ships shooting at each other with missile weapons. They couldn't, for the most part, sink each other's ships, except occasionally with fire, 
because they didn't have cannons yet. Okay, so usually naval warfare was more like land warfare, but from ships. Um, but yeah, 40 crossbows, at 12 pence each the crossbows cost. So if you put that into modern context, you look at a good quality medieval style crossbow, you're probably looking at a few hundred pounds, aren't you? And that was 12 pence. And remember that a common spearman or uh, is earning two pence a day and a, and a common foot archer is earning, earning three pence a day and the crossbow and they had they ordered 40 of them a crossbow is 12 pence a day so they really weren't being paid very much at all um, and it's also interesting to note that they it's also recorded that they purchased um, sheaves 32 sheaves of bolts in other words crossbow bolts um, sheaves like essentially a uh, like a quiver full of um, quill of full of crossbow bolts. Interesting, they only bought thirty two sheaves of bolts, and yet they had forty crossbows. Anyway, um, uh, and um, they were sixteen pence per sheaf. So I think that's interesting. Actually, a sheaf of bolts, sheaf of bolts, actually cost more than the crossbow. Um, but again, sixteen pence. So to buy a thing full of crossbow bolts, sixteen pence, and a common. Archer is only being, being paid three pence a day. Um, so that's pretty interesting, I think. Um, and then another kind of different end of the scale, even more extreme end of the scale, I suppose, um, horses. Okay, now everyone knows, even today, horses are expensive. And it was no different in the medieval period, okay? Horses were super expensive. But remember, and yes, there are many different levels of horses. It's a bit like cars. People say, oh, how much did a horse cost in the medieval period? Well, it's like, how much does a car cost in the modern world? Well, you can spend a hundred pounds on a car or you can spend a million pounds on a car, you know, it depends on the car. And it was pretty much the same thing with horses in the medieval period. But just to give you an idea of some values, it says, a black mare called Juel um, is also mentioned in another document. And the Prince of Wales had a gray horse called Laird. Cart horses were also purchased for the wagons to carry the king's baggage. All types of horses for all types of jobs. And again, a surprising amount of details given. In one undated document of this period, we read of a white horse and a bay horse, each costing 46 shillings and eight pence each. Wow. Um, two roans at 38 shillings, uh, and uh, uh, one at 38 shillings and one at 39 shillings, and three other horses, all with values from 32 to 33 shillings. Now, obviously, these are <laughs> these are expensive horses, and they were obviously cheaper cheaper horses. Um, but you know, it comes back to when people ask me about the value of swords as well, which I've done videos about in the past. I've done a bunch of research into the value of swords in medieval England and I found everything from, you know, a few swords valued at a few pence that were specifically described as old or rusty or broken or whatever, um, from wills and this type of thing, indent um, uh, wills and um, uh, coroner's rolls as well, um, right the way up to swords that cost hundreds of pounds uh, during the time of Henry V, for example, um, that, you know, because they had Toledo blades and jewel hilts and all this kind of stuff. So it, literally you can't, you know, horses, um, swords, things like this, it's very difficult to put an average value on them in the medieval period. Anyway, the main point from my point of view to take away from this whole thing is really that the common medieval soldier was not, um, they were not part of a standing army, they were not in it for their salary, okay? They were in it for the potential loot and career progression, should we call it. Um, and we do know from uh, later indentures, we see people who serve as archers and then later they're serving as men at arms. So they've obviously accumulated enough wealth serving as an archer that they could then invest in more equipment and rejoin as a, as a man at arms and serve as a um, fighting both on, on horseback and on foot with, with armor. Um, so yeah, it really was a, it was a, it was a career um, for some. And we must remember, of course, that for many um, sort of levied raised troops from, from um, geographical areas, they weren't necessarily in it for the money at all. They were just in it because they had they had to do it. They didn't have any choice. Um, so so yes. Yeah, so the pay um, was really fundamentally there to reimburse them for their living costs. Um, so you've got to when you look at medieval warfare and you think about medieval soldiers, don't think of them like med like modern soldiers. Okay, don't confuse the two. They're a completely different type of thing.
certainly modern soldiers in the in the Western world. I don't know about everywhere in the world at the moment, but generally speaking, how we think about soldiers is really quite different to medieval soldiers who were in it for the loot and that structure of you know all, all the loot goes up to the commander and then commander filters it down uh, and the people at the bottom end up with something. But the further up the chain you are, the more of the loot you get and therefore the faster you can um, increase your wealth as it were. So I hope that was interesting um, and I hope that gives you a sense of the fact that medieval soldiers were really only on the same rate of daily pay as a really base level labourer like a builder or um, a, 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 like a wood um, splitter or something like that. Um, many craftsmen, skilled craftsmen were earning more than people like archers and spearmen were earning uh, and probably in some cases earning more even than mounted archers. And so really the soldiers weren't in it for the pay, they were in it for the loot, uh, as far as I can tell anyway. I hope this has been fun and I'll see you for the next video folks. Cheers! Thanks for watching, please subscribe, we have extra videos on Patreon and you can follow us on Facebook.